So continuing on with Russia, in the last video we were talking about some of the industrial improvements, particularly under Finance Minister Sergei Witt, um, but it's important for us to realize that even though they have made significant gains, Russia was still lingering behind in a lot of ways by 1900, and these are a few reasons why here. One of them, I mean, part of it is just I mean, the sheer size of Russia, but we're going to see that about one third of the farmland that Russia actually had was still unused. Um, what you're going to see is that the population was increasing too quickly to uh, to uh, have food production keep up with it, right? So, I mean, basically, with uh, all this industrialization and the creation of, you know, a more factory working class, uh, there just wasn't enough farming to keep up with it. So, uh, so something had to be done about that. Um, just in general, not enough food. Um, and uh, what we're seeing is by the late 19th century, Russia is going to be the most populous nation in Europe. So it's, it's kind of experiencing the population explosion that Western Europe already did. Um, there's going to be an economic depression in 1899. So a lot of the economic gains that were made since 1890 are going to kind of be wiped out. And there's going to be some pretty massive unemployment in Russia. Um, so we're going to see why that is also going to lead eventually to some revolts and uh, to some political reforms, which we're about to talk about. And then, of course, like in so many other examples of history, war can be very devastating to a country's economy. So um, in the next slide, we're going to talk about the Russo-Japanese War, but also just realize that this is another reason why, um, why Russia is struggling economy, economically is because it loses this war. So Russo-Japanese War. All right, what's the cause? It is over land. All right, and um, basically what Russia wanted was to have more control over Manchuria. It already had a sphere of influence there. So you can see here is Korea, there's Japan. So we're, we're kind of looking at um, northern China and, um, and Russia is over here. So if we look at it like a greater map here, we're, we're looking at this area that Russia is interested in, um, in controlling. All right. Um, it's also because it has this sphere of influence in Manchuria. It's actually also looking to control Korea. All right. Here's the problem, and we're going to talk about imperialism much more in the next chapter. Um, so Japan also has imperialistic interests. So it really doesn't want Russia to have influence over these countries. Okay. So basically, these two countries are going to go to war, um, 1904 to 1905, and Russia's motivation to go to war. They're also very nationalistic and they're also somewhat racist. Realize that social Darwinism was very prominent at this period and that up until recently, Japan had been colonized by a lot of, uh, a lot of European countries. The United States had kind of, um, had kind of forced the opening of Japan. Um, other countries also were, col were colonizing um, in places like China, Vietnam, but Japan responds to it in a in a different way. They actually realized that in order to kind of prevent the foreign threat, they actually need to modernize and industrialize and also become imperialistic like so many Western countries. So Japan actually defeats Russia in the Russo-Japanese War, which was seen as a huge embarrassment to the Russians. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately it's, again, Going back to the slide before, it's, it, sh it also results in some pretty uh, severe economic hardship for the Russians. And what they're going to do is, um, is when they lose, not only are they humiliated, but they're also going to shift their geographic focus. So after uh, they lose the Russo-Japanese War, we're going to see the Russians shifting their attention more towards the Balkan region in the Mediterranean, which we'll talk about when we get closer to World War I. All right, so... Um, What's the status in Russia after the Russo-Japanese War? And also previously I talked about how the economy still wasn't doing so great. Well, um, the economy's doing pretty badly and also, you know, people were kind of strained from wartime. Um, we're going to see that mem members of the peasantry and the middle class are going to start to demand some types of reforms on the czar. Um, you're going to see that in general, the people kind of want to turn away from from absolutism and have a more liberal representative government. Some of this was because of the Zemsfos. People were thinking, oh, maybe we can have, you know, a more nationalized parliament. Um, <clears throat> you're also going to see that because Russia is not um, completely, 
homogeneous ethnically, you're going to have some separatist movements inspired by some minorities in Russia, particularly uh, the Polish and Ukrainian peoples that live in Russia. Okay, so um, so those are some of the reasons why the revolution of 18 or 1905 that is takes place. All right, the most uh, important event um, of the revolution of 1905 was the Bloody Sunday Revolt in January. Um, it's a peaceful, it starts out as a peaceful protest, all right? There were 200,000 workers and peasants who want reforms from the Tsar. And so they literally, they, they go to the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg where the Tsar lives. He actually wasn't there. They don't realize that. But they're just peacefully marching to, to present a petition to him to uh, have some reform to help alleviate some of their economic problems. And um, uh, Nicholas, Nicholas II, the Tsar, his troops opened fire on all these peaceful marchers. Okay, so even though the Tsar actually didn't do anything, he wasn't in town, uh, this causes some serious resentment against him and against just the authoritarian nature of the Russian government. And so because of this, there's going to be a bunch of strikes, um, particularly in the cities in Russia and mutinies. And eventually this is going to make Nicholas II realize he has to do something to uh, calm these people down. And so he issues this October Manifesto, which basically is a promise that he will create a parliament in Russia, which is called a Duma. So... What is the Duma? Again, it's a parliament in, um, in Russia, or you could also see it as an assembly that serves as an advisory board to the Tsar. Um, it's elected by universal male suffrage, so this is a really big leap forward to Russia. They issue a new constitution, and this, the constitution is called Fundamental Laws. Um, many of its initial reforms were inspired by countries like France. You're going to see freedom of speech, assembly, and the press. Think about how this goes a little bit further from Alexander II's um, easing of censorship. Now you kind of have complete freedom of expression. Um, but at the same time, the czar does retain his ability to veto laws. So you see that he's not willing to completely submit his authority to the Duma. Um, so uh, other things about the Duma that are significant, um, well, you're going to see that it's kind of sort of like the Second French Republic in France. There are a lot of divisions within the Duma. They're not exactly sure um, which direction they want the government to go into. So because of that, the revolutionary type people that, um, that are trying to influence the Duma don't, don't, don't really have much success because they're trying to drive it in two different directions in a way. Also, the Tsar... Um, really doesn't like the, the more liberal Duma at first and actually dismisses the Duma twice. And in 1907, when the third Duma meets, it's actually much more conservative. And, because it, and, and this is also because um, in between the meetings of these different Dumas, there were some modifications to the electoral laws. So basically what you're seeing is that universal male suffrage kind of goes away and uh, the most property classes are going to have the most influence in selecting the third Duma. So this was a relatively temporary achievement by the time you get to 1907. The Duma, it's still a step forward from absolutism, but at the same time, most of the people that have influence over the Duma are the property classes. All right, they're going to benefit at the expense of the workers. Um, so reform in Russia in terms of um, in terms of politics is relatively small, um, but still a little bit of a step in a, in a more liberal direction. What's going on in Russia economically? You're going to see some mild recovery in Russia uh, following the 1905 revolutions. Okay, so be between 1907 and the outbreak of World War I, um, one of the most important influencers of, um, of agrarian reform was a man named Peter Stolpin. And what he does is he abolishes um, the mirrors or the collective um, village ownership of land, right? And what he actually does is he's kind of encouraging um, 
farmers, more enterprising peasants perhaps to purchase property. Uh, the idea was that farmers might be more productive working for themselves instead of uh, in this kind of co um, collective program. But one of the things that we should think about as we look towards the future is that after World War I, when communism is going to become significantly more influential in Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution, what's going to happen to these enterprising peasants who might have bought um, who might have bought private land after Stolpin gets rid of the mirrors? That's going to be a problem that we're going to have to address in the future. And last but not least, we're starting to see demonstrations that the Tsar is pretty weak, particularly because following 1911, we're going to see that. The Tsar's court actually, good grief, there's another typo, my goodness, Miss Sutton, um, that uh, the court of the Tsar was actually increasingly dominated by um, Gregory Rasputin. And so that shows us that there's a lot of doubt as to whether or not the Tsar actually can lead. And of course, we will see, um, we will see that when, uh, when Nicholas is actually removed during the Bolshevik Revolution. Also, once we talk about World War I, we'll have to pay a particular eye on how Russia actually performs during the war and how that might also have a dramatic effect on uh, Russia's direction um, in the early 20th century. So that's basically um, Russia in two videos here. Realize that it does make some significant industrial development, but we could definitely place limits on its political development by thinking about how um, by thinking about how the Duma is replaced twice um, and the electoral reform that the Tsar institutes before the third Duma ultimately um, is much more conservative. So we'll, we'll have to keep in mind that political reform is arguably much slower than industrial reform in Russia at this point.